All right, Paul. So you've shown us how much energy is liberated by uh, the collapse to a neutron star. That is a lot of energy. Yeah, but let's see. Does it actually match what we see? I mean, a lot is a very vague term. Is it the right amount of a lot? Right. So it looks to us that you're going to get about 10 to the 47 uh, joules of energy out. Uh, so that is uh, a lot of joules. Uh, but the bouncing model, the where you bounce things off, then it looks to see plausible that you might get 10 to the 44 joules out in the bounce. Okay, So let's go through and actually look at how bright uh, a type 2 supernova is, how much energy is in there. So of course a type 2 supernova shines. So if you look at how bright, how many uh, watts or we astronomers still use ergs. There's 10 to the 7 ergs in a watt. And you can see that uh, in this term, uh, there's about 10 to the 42 ergs, or 10 to the 35 uh, watts that a supernova emits for about 100 days. So we can calculate from the luminosity the total amount of energy radiated. OK. But that's not the only place the supernova is going to have energy. Remember, they're big expanding balls of gas. Yeah, so some of it's going to come out as radiation that we can see, yep. but some of it's going to be accelerating the gas. So it's the kinetic energy of a gas, presumably. That's right. And so we can go through and figure out how much kinetic energy there is as well, because we have spectra of these supernovae. And this is hydrogen and helium and uh, hydrogen again. And we can measure the velocity over time. And it turns out uh, these supernovae expand at roughly 3,000 kilometers per second. And there's about 10 solar masses of hydrogen that's expanding at that fast. So we can calculate the kinetic energy. So let's go through and see how much energy is actually in a type 2 supernova. OK, let's start off with the energy that comes out in the form of electromagnetic radiation, light, radio waves, gamma rays, etc. Now we know we have a luminosity of about 10 to the 35 watts for about 100 days. So what's the total energy output? Well, luminosity is a power, so that's energy per unit time, which is why it's measured in watts. So we just need to multiply this by the number of seconds in 100 days. So we get 10 to the 35 times 100 days times 24 hours in a day times 60 minutes in an hour times 60 seconds in a minute. And that comes out as about 10 to the 42 joules. Big, but a very tiny fraction of even the bounce energy, let alone the total energy. But now let's look at the stuff that's fired out. So we've got our supernova, and we've got some sort of shell of material flying out. And it's going at a velocity of about 3,000 kilometers second and the mass is about 10 solar masses. Now right away bear in mind that's a very large mass flowing out which is quite different from our bounce calculation which implied only a very small mass that's going out. So that right away is telling us there's something funny going on. But we can work out the energy here. This is a kinetic energy and the normal equation for kinetic energy is just half the mass times the velocity squared. So if you plug in this, uh, so that's 2 by 10 to the 31 kilograms and 3,000 kilometers a second, multiplied by 1,000 turned into meters per second, we end up with about 10 to the 44 joules. All right, Paul, so let's recap the calculations just made. We have all of this energy, 10 to the 54 ergs, or 10 to the 47 joules worth of energy making a neutron star. But the supernova we see really has several orders of magnitude less than that, that energy. About the same energy that you get out of the bounce. So where's the rest going? I mean, there is this pesky law of conservation of energy. Now, presumably, it's, uh, the reason why the bounce is only a small fraction of the energy is because only a small amount of the matter is bouncing. So the rest of the energy must have something to do with the rest of the matter that's ending up in this ball of neutrons in the middle. 
But how? It has to go somewhere. So where, where could it go? All right, so let's look at how you might form a neutron star in detail. So it turns out that as you're beginning to run out of nuclear power in the center of these massive stars, it's very hot and very dense. And there are gamma rays, essentially, the, the temperature is so high that the black body radiation peaks at gammas, okay? It's 10 to the 10 degrees, incredibly Not. bright. Now, it turns out that if you take an iron atom and you shoot a really energetic gamma ray in it, it the iron likes to fission, okay? And it takes that energy from the gamma ray because remember, it's going to lose energy in this thing. So it's actually going to take that energy out so it can do this reaction. And this reaction is what happened. And so now you have lighter elements. And of course, gamma rays are going to hit them. And indeed, when you get these really hot temperatures that are really dense, things like iron get photo disintegrated. The, all the gamma rays just split the atoms up, eventually all the way down to protons and electrons and neutrons. This is kind of reverse in the whole process. We get the energy of the star by combining these things, and suddenly in a flash it's going all the way back down again. Right. It must so, mop up a huge amount of energy. Yeah, it does. And so it's going to sap up all that energy that is, or a lot of the energy, of course, that is uh, being liberated by the potential energy change, right? So problem solved, that the energy's just all gone away by reversing the nuclear fusion that the star well, spent the last it, it million years doing? You only get a little bit. That's where some of the energy can be uh, uh, getting rid of that way, but not all of it. So it turns out we need to look at that final reaction. You're going to end up with photo disintegration making electrons and protons. And those can't be, you know, gamma rays don't break those apart. Those are pretty fundamental particles. In case of an electron, completely fundamental. But when you get these really high densities, electrons and protons like to get together and make a neutron. And when they do that, they create a neutrino. Uh -huh. So the photo disintegration is going to break all the iron apart into electrons, protons, and neutrons. And all the electrons and protons are going to get together to make a neutron and a neutrino. Okay? Okay. And there's a lot of them. 1.4 solar masses of stuff is that many kilograms, 3 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. And a neutron only weighs 10 to the minus 27. So that's, you know, a couple times 10 to the 57 neutrons in and a neutron star. And each one of those of has a neutrino. Now, astronomy, of course, we're used to big numbers. But that's a big number even to an astronomer. That's a very big number. And so that's a lot of neutrinos. And if you remember, neutrinos are funny. Neutrinos weakly interact. They have tiny cross sections. So they don't have any charge, so they don't interact via electromagnetism. They don't interact via the strong force. So they only interact via another third force in nature, the weak force, which, as its name says, is pretty weak. Right. So they have, if you were to call them a target, they have a cross section of about 10 to the minus 47 meters squared. So let's do a calculation and figure out what that means.